uh, I study English uh, literature at the Faculty of English in Cambridge. And I'm Mark. I study Bronze Age burials, looking at constructions of gender and age ideology in uh, Ireland and Scotland. So we've been thinking together about yes. ways we can combine what we look at. Yeah, so good afternoon. Thank you everyone for um, assembling such an interesting programme and for letting us take part. So the paper we want to present today is the product of an ongoing conversation we've been having about how archaeology can learn from literary critical concepts and vocabulary and how literary studies can in turn reflect upon its own paradigms and assumptions through their deployment in an archaeological setting. As archaeologists, we frequently talk about people and societies through the lens of burial practices, but we often forget what is particular and distinctive about burials as events and constructions, that is, that they are deliberate human acts of meaning making. When, as we typically do, we use burials as data sources for analyses of things like diet, disease, or social differentiation, we bypass the grave's moment of construction to focus instead on the lives of the deceased. And that approach has its obvious merits, but it's important to remember that a, a burial is not a neutral zone in which to find a body. As its ambiguous grammar tells us, the word burial refers as much to the act of burying as to the material residue generated by that act. Burials originate out of loss and stress, the specific circumstances of a particular death, and they produce various meanings for the gathered community, as well as drawing on more general patterns of tradition, ritual, habit, or common language and mindset, as Martin Carver puts it. So attempts to interpret burials must therefore encompass efforts to talk about meaning, about uh, how and for whom meaning functions. It's not, however, our intention to investigate burials hermeneutically to uncover their definitive meanings in individual cases. For meaning, as we understand it, is necessarily reconstituted in imaginative ways by the archaeological interpreter. Nor are we advocating a return to textual readings of material culture, as was current in the 1990s. Rather, we recognize correspondences between the ways in which burials and poems possess meaning, their shared poetic qualities, we could say, and ask whether we can use literary critical vocabulary to open up archaeological interpretative practice to investigate the poetics of burials, the techniques that make meaning possible. Our discussion focuses on one early Bronze Age burial site in Scotland, that of Dunyall Road in South Ayrshire, but the lessons we seek to draw out are general and apply beyond the British Bronze Age or even prehistory. When we talk about burials and poetry, we do so knowing that both terms encompass a vast swathe of practices across time and space. It's useful to begin, therefore, by dwelling upon the particular aspects of burials and poems that we feel are most open to comparison. When we suggest that burials could be deemed poetic, we have in mind the ways that they condense the world, communicate obliquely, and require time to be worked through. Burials are constructions saturated with potential meaning, but this is identified differently by each of the grave's readers. So each reader is able to recognize the burial as a kind of communication, but the message they derive from it will be strongly inflected by their own position in relation to the grave and by the voice in which they imagine it speaks. In figuring the burial as something with a potential speaking voice, we draw on concepts particularly related to lyric poetry. It is the lyric mode with its characteristic forms of invocation and address and its emphasis on imagined and performed communication that we think provides an especially fruitful analogue for burials. During the mid-20th century, the American new critics enlisted the lyric poem, defined for them as the quasi-dramatic monologue of a fictional speaker, as a focus for their preferred methodology of close reading. In their hands, close reading didn't only designate the critical practice of intensely scrutinising a text's verbal and formal details, it also signalled their rejection of context and insistence on the artwork's formal autonomy. More recently, so-called new historicist scholars have reacted against these assumptions re-emphasising context and questioning whether it's possible to talk about lyric as a general category at all. While we're sympathetic to this insistence on the historical particularities of meaning, we also follow Jonathan Culler in recognising characteristics of lyric poetry that recur in sufficiently consistent ways to be discussed in the abstract and taken up figuratively by archaeological practice. 
In theory of the lyric, colour outlines three such typical figures. The first covers formal patterns and structuring devices, whether acoustic like rhythm and rhyme, or optical like lineation and visual design. The second is triangulated address. The way a lyric poem pretends, as colour says, to address someone or something else while actually proffering discourse for an audience. What we hear in our voicing aloud of a lyric poem is our own ventriloquizing of ambiguously directed address, though we often construe this as overhearing a distinctive poetic voice. The third feature colour identifies is iterability, the way a lyric poem commonly evokes an occasion specific enough to be a singular fleeting moment and yet general enough to stand for a series of similar instances. The second and third of these seem particularly fruitful for archaeologists. The lyric reader's double procedure of ventriloquizing a speaking voice and seeming to overhear it appears to parallel what readers of burials do, whether at the gravesite or millennia after. Burials also function iteratively, speaking both to the gathered community and less intentionally to future archaeologists. We'll now attempt to close read the Dinur Road Cemetery, aware that in burials, as in lyric poems, meaning can function in certain unpredictable ways beyond the can of the compositor. So this site was excavated in 2005 and brought to publication in 2007 by Paul Duffy. In many ways, it's a standard early Bronze Age cemetery from this part of the world, consisting largely of cremated remains interred in stone cysts. There are no particularly rich graves or elaborate artefacts. The report, too, is a fairly typical example of interpreted discourse for archaeology. Thus, it marks a good place to start thinking about how to use the vocabulary of lyric poetry to open up the ways that we talk about burials. We'll begin by close reading the site report itself, investigating the manner in which assumptions about the burial are embedded in the language and images used to present it. While aiming at factual objectivity, the report leaves clues about how and against what other pressures this image of objectivity has been fashioned. So at its opening, an abstract and introduction are accompanied by three sets of illustrations, three maps of the area presented at increasing scales, a photograph of the first trench and its setting, and a plan of the excavation with selected context numbers. Each of these images establishes a tension between the temporal and the spatial, or in lyric terms, between iterability and its suppression or absence that troubles the document as a whole. The aerial view adopted by the maps and site diagram is depersonalizing. It neglects the temporal process of moving around the site and excludes the representation of depth or perspective. The loss of depth from these drawings suggests that the important relations between features at this site are juxtapositional and synchronic to do with their characteristics and classifications rather than iterative or sequential, to do with their ritualized repeating in time. This obscures the crucial fact that it is precisely by two sequences of serial action that the site is constructed, the repeated act of burial and the repeated act of excavation. The trench photograph in the middle and accompanying description of the Ayrshire landscape blur those sequences together. The description is written in an ambiguous lyric present tense vertiginously bridging past and present, occasional and eternal, but making the position from which the report speaks seem suddenly less secure. In fact, there are numerous moments that obscure the perspective and agency of the document's speaking voice. The report employs passive constructions persistently throughout, seemingly trying to erase the presence of the archaeologists altogether. But more than this, in the individual cis descriptions, passive constructions and the past participle adjectives from which they're difficult to tell apart take on a more uncanny quality, seeming to speak from two perspectives at once, the burial and the excavation. For example, the report notes that Cis 10 was floored with a thin stone slab. How should we read floored, as an adjective or a verb? In either case, we aren't told how and at whose hands the flooring came about, but it's not just agency that's uncertain here. The temporal moment from which the word speaks is ambiguous too, the cyst was flawed when it was found, it was discovered in that state, but it also was flawed at a moment in the past, as the grave was constructed. That action in the past is covertly narrated within the description of the archaeologist's finds in the present, and we think that the lyric figures of ventriloquy and overhearing offer a way of opening out the strangeness of such moments. In making its description of the cyst as an archaeological artefact, 
It is as though the report simultaneously finds itself impersonating or ventriloquizing the moment of the burial's first construction. Here, lyric supplies a vocabulary that more explicitly admits the imaginative acts of reconstruction that go along with the work of excavation. Color's notion of iterability and triangulated address can also expand our understanding of how burials functioned in the past. To illustrate this, we'll concentrate on the example of Cis 147, one of the few burials of a single person in this cemetery. When the community gathered to make this burial, they followed an established pattern. First, they built a pyre and placed the deceased upon it, accompanied by a piece of worked flint and some animal remains. After the conflagration, they carefully collected the flint and bones and brought them to this site where they built or selected a cyst from the pre-existing collection. Uniquely, this person had been dressed in something held together by a bone pin, and this too had been burnt on the pyre and collected for deposition. This person's cremation and interment alone also departed from the norm. The cyst, pyre, animal remains, flint, and even the burial's location all represent conscious decisions on the part of the community to act in accordance with previous graves, to define this burial as one of a particular type. We can think of this burial as a form of triangulated address, in which the community are party to a communication between the grave's compositor and the deceased, or between this burial and previous burials. The community thus overhears this address, and are encouraged to interpret this burial as one of theirs, fitting within the community of the dead in this particular place. The iterability of practice, functioning as both personal address and universal declaration, are clearly also relevant to how the community would have experienced this burial. In this light, even slight deviations from the norm become interesting, because they indicate that a forceful sense of the particularity of this death elicited a response strong enough to overcome the normative force of the previous iterations of burial. Regardless of intention, this bone pin afforded new ways for the community to be affected by proceedings, and is a reminder that even minor details can reconfigure the entire burial assemblage and mourners' reactions to it. We're not suggesting that this bone pin means something particular that we can decipher through a poetic approach. Rather, we'd like to emphasize that its inclusion within this grave is not insignificant in terms of how people experienced and interpreted the burial assemblage. Critical in this regard is the recognition that such experiences and interpretations need not have been universal. Elements of a burial needn't have a single meaning in order to be meaningful, and embracing the ambiguity of our interpretations is vital if we were to talk about rich and dynamic lived experiences in the past. So to conclude slightly, burial archaeology often focuses on elaborate graves and impressive constructions. In this paper, we've tried to demonstrate that smaller scale actions at the graveside are equally evocative and fertile for archaeological discussions. Interpretative approaches made available by drawing metaphorically on the figure of lyric poetry have proved particularly instructive in recognising the power of these small scale acts. Although we cannot read a burial in the sense of extracting its meaning, we can investigate its poetics, the techniques like tri triangulated address and iteration that kindle its multiple meanings. Approaching burials in this way makes a virtue of focusing on divergences between them and foregrounding the contingencies at play in the construction of meaning, whether in the past or present. These qualities are vitally lacking in how we usually talk about burials. The impact of a burial is particular to its form and to the context in which it exists. Though large-scale analyses can be useful, such approaches put us at too great a distance from the burial assemblage itself to unravel and, pre and appreciate its distinctive features. We should pay more attention to the ranges of interpretation and experience that individual burials open onto, without always seeking to assimilate such observations to larger patterns. One way we might do this is by noticing moments in our writing where agency and perspective come a little unmoored, where our grammar elides several possible speakers and timeframes, or where we engage in a kind of ventriloquizing of the past. Rather than dismissing such effects as conventionally impersonal or rigorously ironing out their ambiguities, we could instead choose to foreground them as markers of a more fluid interpretative space where meaning is made in complex and poetic ways between the site and the people, archaeologists and mourners that visit it. We can take our cue, we believe, from the kinds of literary close reading that do not attempt to determine meanings conclusively, 
or unfold a whole world of context from the words of a single poem, dwelling instead on how a poem works and the possible meaning that suggests to us may leave us without clear, hard facts or definitive answers to our questions, <laughs> but with a far better reflection of the ambiguous and malleable world in which we live. And that's the kind of world that we should be attempting to reconstruct in the past. Thank you very much.